For those of you who've had small children, if you've been a grandparent, you've heard a child say, Mommy, look at me. Or Daddy, watch me. And when I say those words, you can probably imagine if you've had a child hearing those words, what they were doing. We were talking last night about one of the grandchildren. Or, yes, grandchild. One of Ken's grandkids. It's always, Grandpa, watch me. I'm about to do something fantastic, and I don't want you to miss it. There are times in our lives that we all want to be seen. When our children get a little bit older, they want us to be there at that middle school band concert or at the school play or watch me play baseball. The whole TikTok craze is primarily about young people, young adults wanting to be seen. Have you ever been a part of a large group? Maybe worked for a company for a while, been a part of an organization, and you leave for whatever reason. But it's a positive for you you leave. And how quickly time goes by and you're not missed at all. It's like you were never there. And you wonder, what's, what's, what's wrong here? I was important at one time. You know, your wife, your girlfriend, they want you to notice the new haircut. They want you to notice the new dress. A wife wants her family and her husband to notice when she's done things around the house, when things are different. Or they rearrange the furniture, and we walk in and just go right to our chair and sit down. Don't say a word. Even as an adult son, there are still times I wish my dad was here to see the things I've accomplished, to see the things that I've done, just to be proud of me, just to say. And you can go on and on, like Mr. Casperson earlier. There's a bazillion different examples of times that we want to be seen, especially to be seen by those who are important to us. Sometimes we want to be incognito, but when it comes to those who are important, we want to be seen. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. For those of us in a relationship with God, perhaps a person we most want to be seen by is God. While you're turning, I'm going to do some rearranging up here. The last couple of years of my dad's life, he was sick. Not bedridden sick, but congestion, coughing. A couple of nights I was home for one summer, because I was teaching school in Louisiana, home for the summer. A couple of nights, he got me up over the course of the of the summer and had me take him to the emergency room because he couldn't breathe. Everybody in the world had some remedy for this cold and this congestion. He couldn't seem to shake. The doctors didn't catch it. Dad didn't know. He was dying of congestive heart. I think it was better he didn't know. So I think he would have worried even more. But he knew he wasn't getting any better. And it reached a point mentally for him that he shared, I feel like God's left me. I don't know where God is. Because I'm not getting any better. And things don't seem right. And here's a man <clears throat> that had even 50 years of his life, to God. And thankfully, that God didn't re allow him to remain there. Well before, several months before he died, he was back his old self. And he shared with me the events that had taken place to where he felt confident that, yes, God is still a part of my life. But he didn't. When he felt like God didn't see him anymore, it was devastating. It's important to us 
if we have a relationship with God, then God is watching us and is an active part of our lives. But even when he typically is, we can face trials. And I'm looking to the future when we've got to wonder, God, do you still see me? Are you still there? Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And fear not. Just stop right there. It doesn't matter the circumstances we find ourselves in. What it is that's causing the problem. Jesus simply says, fear not. Because verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father seeing what's happened. Don't you know that the very hairs of your head, even Adam's, are all numbered? Fear you not, therefore, for you are of so much more value than many sparrows. In this group, I'm sure there are a number of you that know the song inspired by these words of Jesus. It's a song entitled, His Eye is on the Sparrow. Due to technical difficulties, we're not going to play the video, but I'll read one of the verses and the refrain. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when songs give place to sighing and hope within me dies, I draw the closer to him. From, from care he sets me free. His eye is on the sparrow, and so I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, so I know he watches me. And I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Today we're going to talk about the God who sees. I think the last sermon, or a couple of sermons ago, we spoke about, about faith. We talked about ways in which our faith might be increased. Now, I define faith as a belief that God is who he says he is. And that everything that happens in our lives will be made to work out for our best. And that God, in the end, is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We said that our faith is increased by our recognition and reflection on God's helping hand in miracles in our lives. Again, I reflect to the sermonette <clears throat> in the journal. And a number of years ago, I suggested to our congregation at home having a journal just to record every time you see God act in your life. So that when you get to that time, when you say, where's God? You get that journal out and you go back and you read all the times that God has bailed you out, that God's acted on your behalf. So <clears throat> one way we increase our faith is by making sure we record or at least recognize those times that God has already worked in our lives. The second way, is reading the scriptures and seeing how God has acted in the lives of other people. So today, as we go through these scriptures, we look at these examples, reflect on those times in your own life when God has intervened for you and be touched and encouraged by the examples we're going to look at where God, <clears throat> where God acted in the lives of other people. <clears throat> in ancient times, a woman's value, both in her own mind and, and in that of society, was in her children and in her ability to bear children. A woman who was unable to bear children for her husband to create a family was looked down upon, ridiculed, was often looked at as being cursed by the gods or by the true God. Genesis chapter 30, verse 1. Genesis 30, verse 1. Here we have Rachel, the wife of Jacob. 
And Rachel found herself in just that kind of situation. It's difficult when you find yourself in a helpless situation over which you have no control, but for which everyone blames you for being the problem. Genesis 30, verse 1. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. And she said to Jacob, give me children, Jacob. I'm going to die here. I'm being persecuted. Help me. But Jacob just got angry with her. He said, am I God? Who has withheld from you the fruit of your womb? You know, in those days, there was no way to find out what the problem was. Jacob had children by Leah, so he knew it wasn't him. The only person to blame was Rachel or God. He was one of their faults. And she said, all right, here, take my maid, Billa, go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees that I may also have children by her. Now, there's a weird phrase there. She'll bear upon my knees. It is an old Hebrew idiom. Evidently, when a child was born, the, the first thing they did was to lay the child in the lap of both the father and the mother. So in other words, on her knees. So Billa would have the child, but when it's born, it wouldn't lay on Billa's knees. It would be brought to Rachel to lay in her lap as her child. So she gave him Billa, her handmaid to wife, and Jacob went in unto her. <clears throat> and Billa, in fact, conceived, and she bore Jacob a son. And Rachel said, God has finally judged me. He's heard my voice. He's given me a son. Therefore called she his name Dan. And Bella, Rachel's maid, conceived again. And she bore Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, with great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister. But I have prevailed. And she called his name Naphtali. <clears throat> so Rachel was now relieved of some of the shame the anger, the resentment that she felt by using her handmaid as a surrogate. Bella had had two sons, but Rachel still had none that she could totally claim as her own. They weren't really her sons. Not to be outdone, Leah enlists the help of her handmaid, verses 9 to 21. She offered Jacob her handmaid and bore some more sons for Jacob. Verse 14, there's a curious story and a comment that more than anything else sheds light on how intense this rivalry was. Verse 14, Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother, Leah. And when Rachel saw them, she said to Leah, give me, I pray, of your son's mandrakes. Now, mandrakes were a plant that was thought to improve a woman's fertility if she ate them. Leah had given Jacob her handmaid because, at least temporarily, she was no longer bearing children. Now, neither she nor Rachel were having additional children, and both saw the mandrakes as a very prized possession. So Rachel asked if she can have the mandrakes, and listen to Leah's response. She said unto her, Is it a small matter to you that you've taken my husband? And would you take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, All right. Jacob can come to you this evening if you'll just give me your son's mandrakes. So in Leah's mind, Rachel had stolen Jacob. In Leah's mind, Jacob was her husband, not Rachel's. But remember, Jacob worked first for Rachel. 
and as best we can tell, was tricked by Laban, his father-in-law. Rachel was the love of Jacob's wife. Rachel was the one he worked for. So from the very beginning, Leah must have felt second best. She was the odd one out. And so it may well be that they both had been warring for Jacob's affections since that very first marriage. In verse 20, after providing Jacob four more sons, two from Zilpha, two of her own, Leah begins to have children again. Verse 20, it says, And Leah said, God has endued me with a good dowry. Now, maybe now, my husband will dwell with me, because I've borne him six sons. And she called him his name Zebulun. It's all about whose husband is Jacob. By the time we get to verse 22, Leah has provided five more children to Jacob. And listen to what Rachel says. And God remembered Rachel, verse 22, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son <clears throat> and said, God has taken away my reproach. I now have my own son. And she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. And that, of course, would be Benjamin. Isn't it interesting how that of all the sons of Jacob, you could argue that Joseph and Judah were the two most important. And Joseph was born to Rachel. With Rachel's story in mind, <clears throat> allow these next three scriptures to speak to you and just settle into your heart and mind. Second Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. God's watching. Psalm 34, 15. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. And then Proverbs 5.21. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he prepares his way before him. That's, <clears throat> as most of you know, we are on the road a lot between home and Mississippi, working with the bees. And it's an often a prayer. God, prepare the way ahead of us. You know what's going to be taking place. You know the things we could get into. Look out for us ahead of time before we get there. Genesis chapter 16, verse 1. How often do we consider the number of people that can be and often are impacted by decisions that we make. I left for college one summer, not for college, <laughs> long after that, I left to go back to, to Louisiana to teach school. I'd been home all summer with mom and dad. And I had an old pickup truck I was driving back down there. And halfway between Lexington and E-Town, I broke down alongside the road. My motorcycle was in the back of the truck, so I got it off, showed up back up on Dad's front porch on the motorcycle. Long story short, he went back, he helped me. And in the course of that conversation of repairing the truck, he says, you know, Tony, every decision that you or your sister or your brother make often comes back and reflects on all of us. <laughs> He wasn't upset. He was just trying to teach a lesson that we don't make decisions in a vacuum. And that's what we're going to talk about here. The story of unintended consequences. The results of a single decision. From the time that Abraham and his family left his home in Ur, God spoke to him 
about this land that would one day be his and would one day be for his descendants. The only problem was that by this time, Sarai was 70, or Abraham, Abraham was 75 and Sarai was 65, well past the age when normally you'd be having children. But God continued to insist this land will be for all your inheritance. As the time that Abraham reached, or Abram reached his 85th birthday, and there still were no children, Sarai decided that something needed to be done. Genesis 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. But she had a handmaid, an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has restrained me from me from bearing children. So I want you to go into my maid, that it may be that I may obtain children by her. Now we read that Rachel and Leah's story, we're reading Sarai, <coughs> Sarai and Hagar's story. I know it sounds weird to us that a wife would have another woman bear children for her and her family and then expect the woman that bore the child to have no particular interest in the child, just give it up without worrying about it. As weird as it sounds to us, it brought on just as many problems back in those days too. But no matter, Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. He hearkened to Sarai's voice as opposed to God's voice. Reminds me strangely of even Adam. And he went, verse 4, and he went into Hagar and she conceived. When, but when Hagar saw that she conceived, her mistress Sarai was despised in her eyes. The unintended consequences of a single decision. And Sarai said to Abram, my wrong be upon you. It's all your fault. If you hadn't, that's why Hagar hates me now. I've given my maid to your bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I've been despised in her eyes. So let the Lord decide which of us is guilty here. And Brahm said unto Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your hands. Do to her as it pleases you. And when Sarai dealt heartily with her, she fled from her face. So the child's not even born yet. Sarai wants this child so bad. She gives Hagar to Abram, but now before the child can be born, get her out of here. Hagar fled from her face, and the angel of the Lord found Hagar by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, why, where'd you come from? What are you doing here? Where are you going? Hagar said, well, I'm running from my mistress, Sarai. She kicked me out. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son, and you will call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard it your affliction. He'll be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man against his, but he will dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she, Hagar, called the name of the Lord that spoken to her, you, the God that sees me. For she said, have I also here looked after him that sees me? Wherefore the well was called Birla Heroi, well of the living one, my seer. Behold, it is still between Kadesh and Barad. And Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bore, Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Genesis 17, 23 and 25 is 13 years later. 
Abraham and Ishmael are circumcised. Abraham now is 99. Ishmael is 13. We go on to Genesis 21, verse 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had said. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham his son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken unto him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, who Sarah bore unto him, Isaac. Verse 5. And Abraham was now a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. So it's a year later after all the males in the camp had been circumcised. In verse 8. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne to Abraham, mocking the celebration. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Get rid of this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, not Isaac. Now again, don't forget whose idea this whole thing was in the first place. I mean, the side, the side part. Verse 11, but the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. I have no doubt that Abraham loved Ishmael like, a, like his own son. And now he had a second son that he loved also. So it, this wasn't something Abraham wanted to do. But God said to Abraham, you know, I know it hurts, but don't let it grieve you. Because, because of the lad and the, and the bondwoman. And all this Sarah has said unto you, listen to her, for in Isaac shall your seed be called. Verse 14. So Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and upon the child. And they sent them away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle, and so she cast the child, 13-year-old, I doubt she cast him, but she had her son sit over under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, let me not see the death of my child. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice, and she wept. And God saw and heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven. And he said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Don't fear, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, hold him in your hand, for I will make of him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave her son a drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. Psalm 27. Psalm 27, verse 7. As I mentioned earlier, you know, when times are tough, when we find ourselves in pain, in dire straits, when answers seem to be few and far between, we can begin to wonder what happened to God. Where'd God go? When I married my young bride, I promised to always stick with her, be by her side, never leave her or forsake her. And in me, we wouldn't have tough times. It just meant that when they came, we'd be side by side. David faced a lot of tough times, and he was the first one to remind us that we have a God who will always be there. In Psalm 27, verse 7, he says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said to me, seek your face, my heart said unto you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Hide not your face from me, where you can't see or hear me. 
Put not your servant away in anger. You have always been my help. <clears throat> Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. So that's the origin of the frame. We know that David did lots of things to aggravate God in his life. But we also know that God never left him nor forsook him and stuck with him till the very end. In 1 Kings 8, 54 and 57, Solomon repeats his father's words. Here he's about to take rule of the country. 1 Kings 8, 54, he says, And it was so that when Solomon had made an end of praying, all of his prayers and supplications unto the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. And he stood, <clears throat> and he blessed all the congregation of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord that has given us rest, given rest to all of his people Israel. According to all of his promise, he's done it. There's not one failed, or there's not failed one word of all of his good promise. The promises he promised by the hand of his servant Moses. So the Lord our God be with us, as he was with our fathers. Let him never leave us, nor forsake us. Then in Hebrews 11, I'm sorry, Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6, the author of Hebrews encourages us again the very same words. Thirteen, verse five. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, "I will never leave you, nor forsake you," so that we may boldly say, "The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do to me." Genesis chapter 37 begins a life story of a man to whose life these verses greatly apply. We read this life story and we're amazed by it. We wonder at it. Do we ever consider what if that had been me? How would I have responded? We've already read about the beginning of Joseph's life, but Genesis 37 tells us a lot more about it. In verses 12 to 28, Joseph's brothers plot to kill him. But they change their, their minds. They want the money more, <clears throat> so they sign him into slavery instead. The boys take the money and go home and tell the sad story to dad. And Joseph is left to wait on God to rescue him. In chapter 39, verses 1 through 19, Joseph is sold to an Egyptian guard, captain of the guard, named Potiphar. In verse 2, it says, and the Lord was with Joseph. In verse 4, and Joseph found grace in the sight of his master. That is until verse 19, when Potiphar's wife did what she did, and Joseph ended up in prison. Genesis 39, 20 through 41, 14, we have the story of Joseph's time in prison. Verse 21, <clears throat> the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. You know, this is one of those lives where if Joseph kept a journal of all of God's intervention in his life, he'd be referring to regular because he'd be falling in. He'd go from a good time to a rotten time and thinking to himself, okay, God, okay, God, well, where are you? He'd go back and refer, oh, yeah, well, okay, I'll wait. You'll be there. Well, Joseph spent over two years in prison before he was finally called before Pharaoh. And it was many, many more years before 
he finally realized what God had done in his life and brought him, how he brought him to that point. But he believed that God was who he said he was, and he endured. And through Joseph, God saved Israel and brought them to Egypt. Psalm 139, verses 2 and 3. A lot of these are short if you don't want to return to them. David says to God, you know when I sit down. You know when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Our father is not a prying father. He's not a voyeur. He's not watching us, waiting for us to mess up or to involve ourselves in some kind of sin. He's probably a lot like what all of us as human parents would like to be. He's an invisible father, constantly watching over us to keep us out of trouble as much as he can and bail us out when he needs to. Lots of human fathers and mothers would love to do that with their kids, but they can be seen and the kids push them away. God's just watching out for us. Psalms 121 verses 1 through 8. I lift up my eyes to the hills, and where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. His eyes are continually wide open. He can see you 24-7. Verse 5, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun won't strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore into eternity. And we read these words, we got to remember what we talked about last time. It doesn't mean. God pro promised us a rose garden. It just means that no matter how bad it ever gets, he's still there, and it won't get so bad we can't cope with it. I'm sure when Joseph was sitting in prison, especially initially, and he's in chains, he thought, God, this is not what David is describing here so much. Well, First Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. Some of the most poignant stories of God's seeing are those about women and their children in Scripture. We've spoken about Hagar. We've spoken about Rachel. Now we'll read the story of Hannah. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. And there was a certain man of a certain city of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah. And he had two wives. You notice the theme here <laughs> of, of problems being created? <laughs> he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. The name of the other was <clears throat> Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of, out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave Peninnah his wife and to all of her sons and her daughters portions. But to Hannah he gave a worthy portion over and above. For he loved Hannah. The Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary, Peninnah, also provoked her sorely, for to make her fret and worry and anxious, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, that is, Elkanah taking the family to Shiloh, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her 
that is, Peninnah provoking Hannah. Therefore, Hannah wept, and this time she wouldn't eat. Elkanah noticed and said to her, Hannah, why are you crying so? Why won't you eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Now, poor Elkanah, he was trying to make her feel better, but he couldn't understand what it means to a woman to have a child, have a son. And no, he wasn't better than ten sons. But that's okay, because God was listening. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. And now Eli the priest sat upon his seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she, in her bitterness of soul, <clears throat> prayed unto the Lord and wept sorely. And she vowed a vow and said unto the Lord of hosts, If you will indeed look upon the affliction of your handmaid, if you will just see me and remember me, and not forget your handmaid, but will give unto your handmaid a man child, then I will give unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. In other words, he watched what she was doing. And Hannah, she spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she'd been drunken. And so Eli said to her, how long are you going to be drunk, lady? Get up, get rid of the wine, get out of here. Hannah said, no, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I haven't drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Please count not your handmaiden for a daughter of Belial. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken. Then Eli said, okay, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant you your petition that you have asked of him. And she left and, let, and, then, and she said, let your handmaid find grace in your sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up in the early morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned home. And they came to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about, after Hannah had conceived that she bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, which means heard of God, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Proverbs 15, verse 3. It's kind of apropos for where Hannah was. There were the wicked sons of Eli, and there was the purity of Hannah. Proverbs 15, verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Our last example is Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 17. I'm sure most of you sometime in your driving careers have been going down the road and you've seen a funeral procession coming the other way. And as is the custom in Kentucky, might be other places too, but in Kentucky, we all pull over to the side of the road and we stop our cars until the procession goes by. It's a nice custom. It shows honor and respect. But I wonder how many of us have really ever given a whole lot of thought to that person in a hearse, the family in the cars right behind it, the people that have lost a family member. If you're like me, shame to say, I'm just... How many more cars are there? I'm late. I got to get going. In our final example of the God that sees, Jesus has a similar experience. But unlike me, he has a very different response. And I think it clearly demonstrates the heart of Jesus Christ. 
Luke 7, verse 11. And it came to pass the day after that Jesus went in, into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and a whole bunch of people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much of the people of the city were walking along with her. So they're not in town yet. The city of Nain is about nine miles south of Nazareth. You go up a hill to go to it, down a hill to leave it. So they're passing on this hill, walking to this into the city or out of the city. Two totally different crowds. One crowd is grieving with the family over the death of someone. The other crowd can't wait to see Jesus perform another miracle. They're walking along with this guy that they all just think is fantastic, and their minds are on what's going on with Jesus. I don't know who else is paying attention to the funeral procession, but I know Jesus was. Verse 13, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said to her, don't cry. Now, this lady, this is her only mention in the entire Bible. She wasn't someone following him. She wasn't part of his disciples' family. A total stranger, as far as we know. But yet, he knew her situation. And he stops what he's doing. And he goes to care for her. And he came and he touched the beer. A beer is a cart or frame they're carrying the body on. And they that carried him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a great fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that surely a great prophet has risen up among us, and that God has visited his people. And this story of him went forth throughout all the Judea and throughout all, throughout all the region round about. Neil, if you want to pass out those. Neil's going to pass out some papers to you. Just hang on to those for a little bit. I think I've got enough for everybody to have their own. Um, maybe if he gets short of papers when he gets to the front, maybe you can share. How many wives wish their husbands would be more observant. We were in a restaurant last night. You recall those restaurants where you've got the waitress who is very observant, very watchful, and then the other waitress who you got to stand up and do jumping jacks to get her attention. When I was when I was an employer, Leith and I were having this conversation the other day. I'd, I'd give anything to hire somebody who was observant, who I could put to work, who would look around, who would watch what's going on, and who could do things without being told. Helping dad work on the car when I was a very young man. Dad always wished that I would be more observant, that I could shine the flashlight where he needed it and not everywhere else that he didn't need it. Psalm 33, verse 13. We're blessed to have a God that sees, a God that observes, <clears throat> a God that watches over us. In Hebrew, it's El Roy, the God who sees me. Psalm 33, verses 13 to 22. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of men. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. You know, the king is not saved by his great army. The warrior is not saved by his own great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. 
in his great might, it can't rescue its rider. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. In conclusion, we're going to listen to an oratorio written by Kathy Lee Gifford and sung by Nicole Mullen. The, the oratorio is entitled, The God Who Sees. And the video we will see is, was filmed at Brentwood Baptist Church in Brentwood, Tennessee. <laughs> 